Good morning and welcome to worship. Yay! I am so glad that you are here today. I hope that you feel the welcoming spirit of Jesus Christ as we gather today, today in his name. The ushers are going to pass out the friendship registers. I invite you to sign your name and let us know that you're here. And I'm going to let you know about a few announcements in the life of the church. Spiritual formation team is going to meet after worship today. So if you're part of that group or you just want to have input, it's an open group. We are going to be in the uh, church library. And uh, there's a couple of handouts there for you to pick up when you get in there. And then I'll be there as soon as I can. Christian Education Committee meets after worship next Sunday. And then uh, choir is not going to begin this Thursday, but next. So choir begins Thursday, September 7th. So if you'd like to be part of that group, you're welcome to come to that rehearsal. Or you can talk to Kathy Truesdale and get information. And then I'm going to be on medical leave starting Wednesday, August 30th. Um, I'm having a hysterectomy on Thursday. And so... I'm going to be out of commission for a while. I hope to be um, towards the end of September joining you again in worship, but it's just going to depend on how my recovery is going. So prayers for me on Thursday. Are there other announcements this morning? All right. I don't see any. So Neil is here as our lay leader. He's going to lead us now with the call to worship. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Please stand if you're able for our call to worship. If the Lord had not been with us, us blessed be the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Let us worship God. seated. Our help is in the name of the Lord 
who made heaven and earth. Confident in this ever-gracious, never-failing help, we come before the Lord confessing our sin and seeking forgiveness. Please join with me in the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. Forgiving God, we confess that we are conformed to this world. We conform to this world's frantic pace, too hectic to notice all the blessings you provide. We conform to this world's reckless waste, exploiting what you entrust to our care. We conform to this world's shallow values, oblivious to the giftedness of people different from us. We conform to this world's impatient attitudes, preferring the latest instead of the lasting. Forgive our conformity and transform us, O oh God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, we would have been lost to sin. But it is the Lord who is on our side. And so we are forgiven. Know in your hearts today that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. <laughs> As we are forgiven in Jesus Christ, we are called then to forgive each other. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please turn and share a sign of peace with your neighbor.
are sitting down and kids are coming up. We have kids sermon. Kids sermon time. I have a book to read. We've been reading books all summer while the adults are doing juicy stories from judges. Kids are doing books from Pastor Heather's collection. Today's book is A Family Prayer. I just got this one last week. It just came out. A family prayer. So this is a really nice one for praying for your family. So parents, you might want to check it out. A family prayer. There's why it's so cool. Here we go. My mother is a blessing. Keep her safe from harm. When I wake up in the morning, she shines brighter than the sun. She listens to my hopes and dreams. She watches over me while I sleep. Mothers are a blessing. Keep them safe and well. So this is like your good night prayer. So this person's, when we read the books, like saying a prayer. My father is a blessing. Keep him safe from harm. He wraps me in the comfort of stories about the big wide world. He teaches me to see that rainy days are lucky days. Fathers are a blessing. Keep them safe and well. My grandmother is a blessing. Keep her safe from harm. She bakes buttery lemon pound cakes just for me. Her kisses smell like ginger and cinnamon. Her hands fold mine in prayer. Our hearts are close even when we're far apart. Grandmothers are a blessing. Keep them safe and well. My grandfather is a blessing. Keep him safe from harm. He knows the histories of the world, telling fables and proverbs that guide me. Nose to nose kisses are our special greeting. His jokes make my belly shake. Grandfathers are a blessing. Keep them safe and well. My sister is a blessing. Keep her safe from harm. She keeps my secrets and shows me how invisible ink can reveal mysteries. She helps me find my way. Sisters are a blessing. Keep them safe and well. My brother is a blessing. Keep him safe from harm. When we play chess like champions, I earn every win. He holds my hand when I'm afraid. He never lets me fall. Brothers are a blessing. Keep them safe and well. My auntie is a blessing. Keep her safe from harm. She sings sweet songs she learned long ago from her mother who sang to her at bedtime. She whispers tales of her world travels as she rocks me to sleep. Aunties are a blessing. Keep them safe and well. My uncle is a blessing. Keep him safe from harm. We work side by side in his garden, planting seeds that bring joy to the family table. Flowers bloom and vegetables grow. He treats me to double scoops of ice cream when it's just the two of us. Uncles are a blessing. Keep them safe and well. My cousins are a blessing. Keep them safe from harm. They laugh the loudest at my knock-knock jokes. When we're together, it's like parading in our own circus. We have fun climbing trees, watching snails, and racing squirrels. Cousins are a blessing. Keep them safe and well. My godparents are a blessing. Keep them safe from harm. They were chosen for their kindness and their love for my family. They give the best presents and come to all my big events. Godparents are a blessing. Keep them safe and well. My babysitters are a blessing. Keep them safe from harm. They always care for me and protect me. They know the best games to play and make the tastiest snacks. Babysitters are a blessing. Keep them safe and well. My dog is a blessing. Keep her safe from harm. She protects us day and night. Her funny tricks comfort us. When we walk, she leads the way. 
Pets are a blessing. Keep them safe and well. My family is a blessing. Keep them safe from harm. They show me love. I love them too. I'm thankful for them all. Families are a blessing. Keep them safe and well. I am a blessing to my family. I love them each and every one. When they are far away from me and I am far away from them, my prayers surround us all with peace and love, morning, noon, and night. I am a blessing. I am safe. I am well. I am loved. The end. I like this book because it tells lots of different people that are a blessing in someone's life. Can you think of some people that are a blessing in your life? My grandma and grandpa. Yeah, your grandma and grandpa, that's right. My grandpa has a mustache, but he still has a mustache. <laughs> oh, he has a mustache. My mustache is so I like him. Oh, he says his papa has a mustache, and he likes mustaches, so he likes him. Who's a blessing in your life? Your cat, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Your other grandma has a cat, yeah. How about you, Sam? Who's a blessing? Cats and dogs, yeah. How about you? Can you think of one? Your pets, Josephine? Yes, I love my pets, too. I like this one because the dog looks like my dog. So that was my dog. And you know who else that's not in here, but a lot of us met this week is teachers, right? Teachers are a blessing. I know, it's hard, and now I'll... Yeah, I see Sam's face. Not so much. Not so much right now. I hear you. Yeah. You love school. Add a girl. <laughs> so, yeah, teachers are a blessing too, and they're part of the group that cares for us. But some teachers are easier to get along with than others. So we thank God for all of our blessings, and thanks for listening to my story. Have a great day. Our first scripture reading is Psalm 124, which can be found on page 498 of your pew Bible. <clears throat> if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when our enemies attacked us, then he would have swallowed us up alive, or the anger was kindled, kindled against us. The flood would have swept, up, swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us his prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our hope was in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. So we're the Lord. Thank you.
Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we ask that you would be with us today as we read what is arguably one of the most difficult texts in our whole Bible. We ask that you would be present with us, that we would have the courage to look at things that are difficult to look at, that you would give us a spirit of hope as we read of dark things. We ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together would be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Friends, today is the final chapter in our summer sermon series, Juicy Stories from Judges. It has been a very entertaining summer with stories of Ehud and Fat King Eglon, Gideon and his rolling barley loaf, Abimelech and the Israelites' descent into violence, Jephthah and his sacrifice of his own daughter, and Samson and his reckless love of women. Today, we come to what is arguably the most offensive story in all the scriptures. If you want to argue about whether or not the Bible belongs in school libraries, Judges chapter 19 should be your go-to text. This text will be difficult for us to study this morning as it contains extreme violence against women, including rape and murder. Anyone gathered here today who reaches a point of hearing too much is more than welcome to step out for a bit. I will not be offended if you have to leave. I want this to be a safe space for everybody, but I also want this to be a place where we face the difficult truths of the Bible and its history head on. We left off last week with the story of Samson. He had been a judge of Israel for 20 years, but there was no peace during his reign. Now that Samson has died, there will be no more judges, and Israel has descended into complete and utter chaos. The chapters that we're skipping for today are chapters 17 and 18, and they detail a story of religious chaos. It's a story about folks crafting their own idols, making their own priests. The Levitical or priestly class is no longer committed to the proper worship at the tabernacle, and it's every man for himself. As you can imagine, religion was used for manipulation and private gain. Not so different than some religious communities today. We pick up our story in Judges chapter 19. If you dare to follow along, it starts on 206. In those days when there was no king in Israel, a certain Levite residing in the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. But his concubine became angry with him, and she went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah and was there some four months. Then her husband set out after her to speak tenderly to her and bring her back. He had with him his servant and a couple of donkeys. When he reached her father's house, the girl's father saw him and came with joy to meet him. His father-in-law, the girl's father, made him stay, and he remained with him three days. So they ate and drank, and he stayed there. On the fourth day, they got up early in the morning, and he prepared to go. But the girl's father said to his son-in-law, Fortify yourself with a bit of food, and after that you may go. So the two men sat and ate and drank together, and the girl's father said to the man, Why not spend the night? Enjoy yourself. When the man got up to go, his father-in-law kept urging him until he spent the night there again. On the fifth day, he got up early in the morning to leave, and the girl's father said, Fortify yourself. So they lingered until the day declined, and the two of them ate and drank. When the man with his concubine and his servant got up to leave, his father-in-law, the girl's father, said to him, Look, the day is worn on until it's almost evening. Spend the night. See, the day's drawn to a close. Spend the night here. Enjoy yourself. Tomorrow you can get up early in the morning for your journey and go home. But the man would not spend the night. He got up and departed and arrived opposite Jebus, that's Jerusalem. He had with him a couple of saddled donkeys, and his concubine was with him. When they were near Jebus, the day was far spent, and the servant said to his master, Come now, let us turn aside to the city of the Jebusites and spend the night in it. 
But his master said to him, We'll not turn aside into a city of foreigners who do not belong to the people of Israel. We will continue on to Gibeah. Then he said to his servant, Come, let us try to reach one of these places and spend the night at Gibeah or at Ramah. So they passed on and went their way, and the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. They turned aside there to go in and spend the night at Gibeah. He went in and sat down in the open square of the city, but no one took them in to spend the night. All right, so we got a story here of a certain Levite. Remember, the Levites are the priestly class, the guys of the class of priests. He has a concubine, which is like a wife, but different. All women are property in the Old Testament, which is going to factor heavily throughout our story today. A concubine is like a second-class wife, so no honor there. The story says she's left her husband. As we continue, you'll find that this is quite likely due to abuse. This guy is a real jerk. The woman goes home to her father to escape, but four months later, the Levite is back to get her. Her father seems reluctant to let the man leave with his daughter. Perhaps the daughter has told her father about the abuse she endures. But the woman is the property of the Levite, and so when he decides it's time to go, she has no choice. On the way home, they stop in the town of Gibeah to spend the night. And we start to get inklings of trouble here as the people of the town do not practice the required hospitality of Israel. Then at evening, there was an old man coming from his work in the field. The man was from the hill country of Ephraim, and he was residing in Gibeah. The people of that place were Benjamites. When the old man looked up and saw the wayfarer in the open square of the city, he said, Where are you going? Where do you come from? And he answered him, We're passing from Bethlehem and Judea to the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, from which I come. I went to Bethlehem and Judah, and now I'm going on my way home. Nobody's offered to take me in. We, your servants, have straw and fodder for our donkeys with bread and wine for me and the woman and the young man along with us. We need nothing more. And the old man said, Peace be to you. I will care for all your wants. Only do not spend the night in the square. So he brought him into his house and fed the donkeys, and they washed their feet and ate and drank. And while they were enjoying themselves, the men of the city, a perverse lot, surrounded the house and started pounding on the door. They said to the old man, the master of the house, Bring out the man who came into your house so that we may have intercourse with him. The man, the master of the house, went out to them and said, No, my brothers, do not act so wickedly, since this man is my guest. Do not do this vile thing. Here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out now. Ravish them and do whatever you want to them. But against this man, do no such vile thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine and put her out to them. And they wantonly raped her and abused her all through the night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. And as morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was, until it was light. This is horrible. This is horrible. An old man offers the Levite and his traveling party shelter. And reminiscent of the story of Sodom, during the night, the men of the city come to attack the visitors. This is not about homosexuality. This is about hospitality. The sin here is that the people are supposed to welcome the stranger, not use them for their own devices. The homeowner offers his virgin daughter and the Levite's concubine to the men instead. But before he can act, the Levite grabs his own wife and throws her out the door. In the story of Sodom, the men are blinded before they can attack. But there is no such mercy here. The woman is gang-raped throughout the night and finally passes out on the doorstep. In the morning, her master got up, opened the doors of the house, and when he went out to go on his way, there was his concubine lying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. Get up, he said to her. We're going. 
but there was no answer. Then he put her on the donkey, and the man set out for his home. And when he had entered his house, he took a knife, and grasping his concubine, he cut her into twelve pieces, limb by limb, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. Then he commanded the men whom he sent, saying, Thus you shall say to all the Israelites, Has such a thing ever happened since the day that the Israelites came up from the land of Egypt until this day? Consider it, take counsel, and speak out. We see the caliber of this Levite clearly in this text. He has no mercy or care for his wife at all. He sees her on the doorstep, clearly alive, and calls to her to get up so they can go. And when she doesn't respond, he places her upon his donkey and forces her to continue the journey home. And when they arrive home, the woman is not safe. She's been used by many men and is no longer of value to the Levite. So he literally throws her away. He grabs her, kills her, cuts her body into 12 pieces, and sends her to the 12 tribes of Israel. Why? Is he mad at how she was treated? No. He's mad at how he was treated. The men of Gibeah wasted something that was of value to him. That is the only sin that he sees. In chapter 20, the men of Israel begin to get upset, and they decide that they're going to go to war with the tribe of Benjamin, of which Gibeah is a part. 25,000 men die, as well as all the women, children, and livestock of the clan. The cities are burned, the tribe is almost obliterated, and only 600 men of Benjamin remain. We pick up our reading in chapter 21. Now the Israelites had sworn at Mitzpah, No one of us shall give a daughter in marriage to Benjamin. And the people came to Bethel and sat there until evening before God, and they lifted up their voices and wept bitterly. They said, O Lord, the God of Israel, why has it come to pass that today there should be one tribe lacking in Israel? On the next day, the people got up early and built an altar there and offered burnt offerings and sacrifices of well-being. Then the Israelites said, Which of all the tribes of Israel did not come up in the assembly to the Lord? For a solemn oath had been taken concerning whoever did not come up to the Lord at Mitzvah, saying, That one shall be put to death. But the Israelites had compassion for Benjamin, their kin, and said, One tribe is cut off from Israel this day. What shall we do for wives for these who are left, since we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them any of our daughters as wives? Then they said, Is there anyone from the tribes of Israel who didn't come up to the Lord at Mitzvah? And it turned out, that no one came from Jabesh Gilead, for no one had come from there to the assembly. For when the roll was called among the people, not one of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead was there. So the congregation sent, oh, I just lost my spot. They sent 12,000, that's how many, 12,000 soldiers, and commanded them, go, put the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead to the sword, including the women and the little ones. And this is what you're supposed to do. Every male and every woman that's lain with the male you shall devote to destruction. And they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins who'd never slept with a man and brought them to the camp at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. Then the whole congregation sent word to the Benjamites who were at the Rock of Rimmon and proclaimed peace to them. And Benjamin returned at that time and they gave them the women whom they had saved alive of the women of Jabesh Gilead but they did not suffice for them. All right, what's going on? So the Israelites turn around and say, wait a minute, what have we done? The tribe of Benjamin is almost gone, and it surely will be if we can't get these men wives. But what are we going to do since we promised no women for the tribe of Benjamin? I know what we'll do. We'll murder more men and rape more women. The men of Israel decide to attack Jabesh Gilead since they didn't help destroy Benjamin. They kill everybody but the virgins, and they present 400 virgin brides to the 600 men of Benjamin. The people had compassion on Benjamin because the Lord had made a breach in the tribes of Israel. So the elders of the congregation said, Why 
what shall we do for wives, for those who are left, since there are no women left in Benjamin? And they said, there must be heirs for the survivors of Benjamin in order that a tribe may not be blotted out from Israel. Yet we cannot give any of our daughters to them as wives, for the Israelites had sworn, cursed be anyone who gives a wife to Benjamin. So they said, look, the yearly festival of the Lord is taking place at Shiloh, which is north of Bethel, on the east of the highway that goes from Bethlehem to Shechem to south to Lebanon. And they instructed the Benjaminites, saying, Go and lie in wait in the vineyards and watch. And when the young women of Shiloh come out to dance in the dances, then come out of the vineyards and each of you carry off a wife for himself from the young women of Shiloh and go to the land of Benjamin. Then if their fathers or their brothers come to complain to us, we'll say to them, Be generous and allow us to have them, because we didn't capture in battle a wife for each man, but neither did you incur guilt by giving your daughters to them. The Benjamites did so. They took wives for each of them from the dancers whom they'd abducted, and then they went and returned to their territory and rebuilt the towns and lived in them. So the Israelites departed from there at that time by tribes and families, and they went out from there to their own territories. Yay! Yay! The men have compassion on their fellow men, but they continue to have no compassion for their women at all. We still have 200 men of Benjamin without wives, and that won't stand. So a plan is devised for the remaining men of Benjamin to hide out in the vineyards around Shiloh and attack the women there as they come to dance for the festival. If you can grab her, then she's your wife. Isn't that a nice story of biblical marriage? And the book of Judges concludes, In those days there was no king in Israel, and all the people did what was right in their own eyes. As a woman, I find these texts extremely traumatic and devastatingly depressing. These are stories that would rock the core of any person's faith. Where is God? What is the message? Why would these horrible things happen to innocent people? I wish I could tell you that there is a reason or a purpose here, but there isn't. The people have forgotten about God and everyone just does whatever they want to do. And when society declines into that level of complete chaos, women are the ones who suffer. In her 1984 feminist classic, Texts of Terror, Phyllis Tribble offers a moving tribute to the unnamed concubine of Judges 19. Of all the characters in scripture, she is the least. Appearing at the beginning and close of a story that rapes her, she is alone in a world of men. Neither the other characters nor the narrator recognize her humanity. She is property, object, tool, and literary device. Without name, speech, or power, she has no friends to aid her in life or to mourn her in death. Passing her back and forth among themselves, the men of Israel have obliterated her totally. Captured, betrayed, raped, tortured, murdered, dismembered, scattered, this woman is the most sinned against. Her body has been broken and given to many. Lesser power has no woman than this, that her life is laid down by a man. I mourn this unnamed woman as I mourn all unnamed women of our time and place. In so many ways, we too live in a time when everyone does what is right in their own eyes, and women bear the brunt of men's violence and disdain. Women are still treated as property in issues of human trafficking and marriages of abuse. Women are treated as less than when the leaders of government have more rights over our bodies than women do themselves. Women are cast aside as churches continue to silence the stories of women and push them out of pulpits and positions of power. When everyone does what is right in their own eyes, women suffer. 
The people of Israel are in a low place. The stage is set for a new way of living under the leadership of kings instead of judges. A period of peace is on the way, though it will be short-lived, as God's favorite king will soon take the throne. David, ironically from the Benjamite clan that is saved at the end of this reading, David will usher in a period of peace and prosperity. But women will not be lifted up. It takes the arrival of Jesus Christ for women to begin to be treated as equals. Jesus honors women by making them the first purveyors of the gospel, bringing news of resurrection to all people. Without women preachers, there would be no Easter. The church and society have struggled with that good news, and the temptation has always been to push women away and cast us aside. But God honors women as much as men, created as equals in the beginning, serving as equals until the end. Our mother God honors all women, even if her sons can't figure that out. In our day and age, as everyone does what is right in their own eyes, I entreat you to look to and encourage the causes of women. Our sisters are stronger than any Samson or any man. We have suffered and struggled, and still we stand tall, proud bearers of a difficult history. We too are God's chosen people, and in times of chaos, we will rise. Amen. I like to do stuff like that before I go away because I can say whatever I want and then you forget about it and then I come back and everybody's happy to see me.
seated. We come now to our time of prayer, sharing our joys and concerns together as a community, and I'm wondering what joys and concerns folks have that they would like to pray for today. Joys and concerns today. Bill. Yeah, prayers for Bill and Martha as they move this week uh, uh, for settling into a new home and new community. Yeah, definitely. Other joys and concerns today. Nancy. Yes. Prayer for surgery and recovery for me. My surgery is on Thursday. Here in town. Yes, Abigail. Yeah, all the animals in the heat. Andrew. Uh, I just started with several other people uh, trying to make uh, a new position, so I'm now a senior in the first counselor. Okay. Prayers for Andrew and his new job setting. Marjorie. Continued prayers for baby Milo. Others? Yeah, Henry. Prayers for Elise, who's also having surgery. Others? Prayers for peace as we suffer unending gun violence. Others? Tom? Yes, uh, I have three. This is from uh, Henry's sister, Carolyn. I was going to pray, but I was shooting to get this. I know she wanted prayers for Elise. Apparently, it hasn't been covered on that. That's okay. We got it. Okay. Uh, first of joy as uh, Ted and Mary Garden celebrate their 63rd wedding anniversary. And prayers for safe travel for both Neil and Susan Seif, who are going to or from Florida. All right. So continued prayers, or prayers for Elise, who's having surgery, for Ted and Mary, who are celebrating their 63rd wedding anniversary. That's a lot of years, Ted and Mary. And for safe travels for Neil and Susan as they prepare to head to Florida in the midst of weather. Yes. Prayers for Karen's family for safe travel as they celebrate her mother's birthday. Others? Yeah. Definitely. Prayers of thanksgiving for the arts in our community. Other joys or concerns? Yes. Prayers of thanksgiving that it's cooled off. And prayers for more rain. Others? Yeah. And women. Prayers of thanksgiving for women. Others? Yeah.
Thank you. I was talking to Neil Fowler about this sermon. I was like, either it's prophetic or it's just, I'm way out. (laughs) Just so you know, that Judges 19 text was the um, exegesis text for all, for the Bible content exam. And it was a big deal because they made it that Judges 19 and everybody was like, you can't do Judges 19. No one would ever preach on Judges 19. And forcing people to do deep dive study into that text was not seen as a good thing because it could be really triggering for some people. You know, you can't do that. So that was another reason I wanted to look at it was because they, the, you know, the denomination had forced people that were trying to get ordained to, to prepare sermons on Judges 19. Just like, it's the worst. This is legit the worst. Any other prayer concerns? Lorraine, Thanksgiving for music. We love it, definitely. All right. Well, friends, let us turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Today, let us open our hearts in prayer to the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for children who are in trouble. Keep them safe from those who would harm them and deliver those who are neglected or abused. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for nations plagued by warfare. Take away the weapons of violence and make us instruments of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who serve others. Give energy and encouragement to all teachers, leaders, givers and helpers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for people who are in prison. Set us free from every kind of captivity, addiction and affluence, poverty and prejudice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the joys and concerns of this gathered community of faith. We pray for those facing surgery this week, including me and Elise. We pray that your healing hand would be upon us. We continue to pray for baby Milo as he improves, and we give you thanks that he is now closer to his mom. We pray for safe travels for Neil and Susan, for Karen's family, and for Bill and Martha as they move. We ask your blessing upon them. We pray for Andrew and his new job setting, for all the ones who were lifted up to supervisory, that it would be a blessing for them. We pray for peace on earth, especially in this country, and our unending struggle with gun violence. Lord, we pray that you would help us find a better way. We offer thanksgiving today for the cooler weather, and we pray for more rain. Thanksgiving for the arts in this community. Thanksgiving for animals, and we pray for those that have had to get outside through this heat. Thanksgiving for Ted and Mary and their anniversary. Thanksgiving for special music, for all the women who lead the church, and for pastors who dare to preach. We continue to pray for Margaret and Michael, our friends in Malawi, and people of Ukraine. We continue to pray for those who have suffered abuse like the women in our Bible today. We continue to pray for those that are looking for work, for those that are deployed in their families, for those serving as first responders in their families, for this good earth, this country, and this church. And we say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the private concerns that weigh heavy on our hearts this day. We offer them to you in this moment of silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Blessed are you, O Lord, for you have promised to build us up as your church, the body of Christ. Empower us to bind up what is broken and to set free those who are oppressed, that the gates of your holy realm may be opened through Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's not in your bulletin, but Wynne's going to come up and offer a minute for stewardship for us. She's going to tell us about those popsicle sticks. Did everyone, did everyone get one? Yeah, I love it. You're showing me your popsicle sticks. If you didn't get one, the ushers can give you one. Will the ushers pass out the pens? Okay. A few months ago, we came to you at saying that the roof was in need of um, big repairs, and we asked you to pledge to pay for those repairs. Today, you have to, to date, you have gifted and given portions of your pledges of almost one-third the cost of the entire roof repairs. You're awesome. Pretty great. The three-year campaign for the roof has had a fantastic start. Now, why did you pledge? because somebody up here said, we need to pay for this roof. But we hope that you also pledged with a hope for the future of First Presbyterian. What do you see your hope for in the future of this place? Because that's what a roof does. It keep, keeps us going. Think of a word or a short phrase that describes that, your hope for this future, for the future of this church. Put it on a stick, make it fit. <laughs> and put it on the stick that you, were, you selected or were given and pass your pen. To show that progress and faith you have in the future of the church, the Stewardship Committee has this visual for you. See, I've already put a couple of sticks on there and I put my word, I hope this church will always have joy. What are some words that you can think of? Welcome, Welcome. I like it a lot. I felt welcome two years ago so much. Yes. Service. Service? Service like work. Service. Service. Great. Anyone else? Yes. Sanctuary. Love it. Love. Congregational health. That's a big one. Can you fit it on your stick? All right. Yes. Acceptance. I love it. Yes. Justice. Perfect. Okay. So all those words, and even if you copy one another, that's okay. We'll just get them on there anyway. Or we might stack them, whatever. When, um, when we have the offering, you can put your stick and your pen back in that offering plate. And next week, you can look for your phrase on this symbol of our faith in our future by bringing that roof. This is just a physical symbol Thank you for making sure that this physical symbol of the church and believers will still be here for more believers and their work in the years to come. You've done a, a fabulous thing putting that roof back up there. Thank you. We all have different gifts, but we are members of one body. We are called to present ourselves as a living offering, holy and acceptable to God. This is our spiritual worship. Let us offer our lives and our gifts to God, who is the giver of life. I invite you now to present before the Lord your tithes, your gifts, and your very hearts, as once again Lorraine and I offer a gift of music.
Gracious God, we thank you for the measure of faith you have given to each of us. Increase in us generosity, compassion, and prophetic courage so we may continue to be your body in and for the world. With thanksgiving, we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Our spiritual formation team meeting after the service in the uh, library. And uh, take care. I want to miss you guys. I'm going to miss you guys. I'll be watching from afar and then hopefully here in person. But I'll, I'll miss being here with you. So go forth from this place in peace to love and serve the Lord. And my friends, be blessed by the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit now and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.